Hello again. Um, my uh, talk today is uh, a dialogue about um, <clears throat> different aspects of what we know or think that we know about IBD today and try to uh, break down what is myth and what is science. Uh, the original talk was IBD medical therapy, but I weaved in some surgical questions um, and um, I changed the topic, sorry Teresa to uh, IBD therapy, not just medical therapy. And again, it's uh, more of a dialogue. I don't have a million slides to go through, but I thought we can talk about um, different ideas that are on everybody's mind. They come up constantly in clinic, and uh, I thought maybe we'll discuss those together today. By uh, definition, the, uh, a myth is a widely held but, but false belief or idea and reality is the state of things as they actually exist. So the state of things as they actually exist. So I'm going to take you through a practice run. If I say I am pretty tall, <laughs> is this a myth or is this a reality? I'm glad <laughs> Lucas is not here to tell me it's a, it's a joke, right? Uh, correct, it is a myth. So I've not gotten over it. Um, let's move on to this next statement. I or we uh, caused IBD to happen. Is this a myth or is this a uh, reality? Without doubt, this, uh, this is a myth. Um, short and sweet, there is no individual act that we as individuals or families can or cannot do to cause or prevent uh, IBD, it's not down to one factor, it's not down to one gene side of the family or the other. Um, what we know today about the cause of IBD, and you've seen this in Dr. Lee's talk earlier uh, today, and this goes really for most known chronic conditions uh, in uh, human beings, so this is not unique to IBD, but we know that there is a very, very complicated interplay between uh, the genes, our gene makeup. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the genes in a second, but as you saw from Dr. Lee's talk, um, we started out with one gene marker for IBD and now we're up to 163. But despite that knowledge, uh, only a small fraction of IBD can be directly linked to, to a uh, genetic uh, change. Um, and I was turning to uh, a parent earlier today about the fact that the majority of IBD patients, the overwhelming majority, do not have a family history of IBD. So it's not, you know, your genes, even if you have one family member on your side uh, of, uh, of the child's family who has IBD, it does not mean that that's the side that is causing or responsible for that IBD. And I think it's really important to know that uh, as parents um, uh, and not to really doubt the fact that we did not cause IBD. The second factor in causing IBD is the mucosal immune system. Now the mucosal immune system uh, is uh, in a way dictated by our genetic uh, makeup. So the genes uh, control what cells are active or inactive and what they produce and how much of that chemical do these cells produce or not. So there is a genetic influence on the mucosal uh, immune system. So the, the uh, um, cells that fight infection or generate inflammation and allergy or for no apparent cause in, as, as in uh, the case in IBD. Um, but also the big uh, uh, component of it, as you heard in Dr. Suskin's uh, talk, uh, the environment and his focus was on the internal environment or the microbiome, the organisms, the living organisms in our bodies, whether they are bacteria, and we've been able to study bacteria because we can test for the bacteria, but let's not forget that there are, you know, trillions of viruses. Uh, they're difficult to study, but we cannot dismiss the fact that they play a role in the microbiome balance and also um, different types of yeasts and different types of simpler molecules that resemble an organism but depend on an organism like a bacteria to be active. So when you put all these extremely complicated factors together, that's when IBD happens. So we cannot shrink it down to should not have eaten french fries, you know, multiple times that year or that month or that week. Um, and, and again, we don't know of any particular strategy to prevent IBD from happening uh, in the first place. Maybe one day we will get there, but as far as we know today, that's not the case. Um, to go back to the genes, and this is a point 
that fascinates me and uh, I try to bring this up in every talk because it's very very exceptionally difficult to dismiss uh, when you look at identical twins so identical twins share the same genetic code they have the same gender they look exactly uh, alike um, when you look at um, in, in children twins sharing the same household obviously sharing the same parents sharing probably the same diet, the same temperature, they travel together, likely go to the same school. So there isn't really much of a difference between identical twins growing up. But when it comes to IBD, especially for Crohn's disease, if you have one twin with Crohn's disease, even in childhood, the chances of having the other twin have Crohn's is only 50%. If you would expect the environment to be identical, you would, ex you would know the genetic makeup is identical. Why does Crohn's disease happen in one twin but not the other in uh, half and some studies actually point that even half might be exaggerated it may be only that a third of the identical twins both get Crohn's disease at the same time and this does not even exist for ulcerative colitis so the the fact the fact that both twins would have ulcerative colitis is extremely less common so that tells you that you know despite having the same genetic makeup despite having the same environmental exposure it does not mean that IBD will happen right then and there. And that tells me that there is probably an element of random occurrence of something, either the way that the genes are expressed or the randomness uh, of how the bacteria and these other microorganisms change in our bodies. So if you take bacteria and you put it in a test tube and then you take samples from that test tube and let it grow across 20 or 30 test tubes, the bacteria that came from this, the same origin will grow to have way different characteristics because there's a lot of rock, uh, luck involved in the DNA duplication. And it's part of what makes evolution uh, possible. Uh, we go through these random changes in our genes. The good changes uh, stay. Um, for animals, the not so good changes do not survive. So the change in DNA is constant. Uh, we cannot control most of it. And it's not our DNA only, it's also the microbiome DNA. So I think there is a lot of uh, evidence, loud and clear, that we do not have a lot of influence on causing IBD just as much as, as um, we sometimes might feel guilty about that. So we should not. Let's move to the other statement here. <clears throat> if uh, a patient uh, says, uh, it's okay to have one or two uh, flares a year. It's better than three or four or five or six flares a year. Is that uh, a realistic concept uh, or not? Uh, I would you know, strongly propose that this is a myth. Uh, the notion of having one or two flares a year um, should not be okay. Um, and I'll guide you through my reasoning why I do not think that that should be uh, acceptable. Um, we know that IBD affects young individuals. Uh, most of uh, our IBD patients present between the ages of uh, 10 to 30 years. Um, when it comes to pediatric gastroenterology, the average age for an IBD patient to uh, come and see us is about 12. So the age group of 10 to 20 years is a time frame when a lot of uh, dynamic changes happen in our bodies, and it's not just uh, uh, growing physically, but it's also going through puberty, so developing the sexual characteristics, um, developing a bone, our bone density, which is a deposit account that we fill up with more and more strength and calcium and calcium-related chemicals, um, structural chemicals, until we are 20, and then we all, all human beings, start losing their bone density. So 10 to 20 years, you look at all of these things happening in addition to school, and then the individual's own development. Uh, Teresa talked about independence, uh, autonomy in adolescence. Um, and IBD, again, delves into each and every single aspect of that. But it also means that these uh, years, the 10 to 20 years, are so precious that when a process here is interrupted and not recovered from effectively, then you cannot make up for that loss beyond the age group of 10 to 20. Um, so we have to go back and say for an IBD patient in this uh, phase, we have to do everything possible to get the disease to be so controlled that it does not touch or even dare to touch any of these processes. Now, um, 
when you look at the treatment goals, um, this is exactly what we shoot for, and this is the list what we, that we go through uh, at our center with every patient. If we're doing our job right, the medicine or the nutrition plan uh, is working effectively, then we should be in remission, defined by having zero symptoms, completely normal growth, completely normal blood tests, normal bone density, uh, being free of any uh, steroids or prednisone, and also having healing of the lining of the intestine. Uh, the reason why this is important, as you'll see in the next slide, is because it seems like feeling better is one thing, but feeling better and healing the lining of the intestine is a deeper level of healing. And that may change, actually, the natural history. So having the bowel completely healed today has an effect on how the bowel would look like with the inflammation in five years or 10 years and maybe longer, not just for the next three months or year, but again, five or 10 years. And when you look at all of these things satisfied together, this is when we don't see flares. And that's why it's important to redefine how we want to look at the disease treatment and say, no, having one or two flares a year, it's not okay if you're on a treatment or on this or that um, uh, plan. Uh, because if you're truly healed, you should have no flares. And I have to say that we can achieve this in the majority of patients. And there are certainly um, instances where we're not able to achieve this. And, and you know, that's when alternative plans, maybe surgery, um, comes, in, uh, comes in handy. But until we try all the effective options that we have, nutrition and medication, to get there, I think we should keep trying. And again, the emphasis is that if you are uh, able to get a patient into all of uh, these goals here satisfied, um, then there should be no one or two flares a year. And again, it's, it's a big concept to, uh, to keep in mind. So why is that uh, concept of healing the lining important? We know for sure that if you have not just a, f uh, a patient feeling better, but having that deep healing, um, then it's, it's a good chance that these patients will not need another course of steroids um, down the road. There's a good chance that these patients would not need hospitalization, uh, would not progress to needing surgery. Um, if we have uh, a pediatric patient who's not in mucosal healing, there's a very high chance that over the next three months to 12 months, they will need a treatment change. Um, so again, even if they're feeling better. Um, and what we know now also that there's some uh, capacity to de-escalate therapy. So if you're on two medications, you can go down to one. And we're exploring that concept here at our uh, center only if the treatment plan that that patient is on uh, is coupled with deep healing or deep mucosal healing. So uh, the next statement, steroids can be avoided altogether. In other words, we can uh, avoid using uh, steroids for some patients and never have them use steroids. Is that a myth or reality? Um, it is a reality. And it's not to say that this is uh, something that works for 100% of patients, but I would say in at least half of our patients, we would be able to avoid uh, steroids. These are some of our active medical uh, therapies, and I want to add nutrition here as a key important thing. Um, the medicines that could get the inflammation into remission uh, fairly fast would be nutrition, steroids, and anti-TNF antibodies. And we know that steroids have a lot of side effects, especially if they were to be used over and over. So if you take the steroid part out, we are able to get patients into remission just by using nutrition or by using anti-TNF antibodies and not using steroids at all. What about maintaining that remission? Um, we know that we can maintain remission, again, which means not needing steroids, with different medications. Um, to some degree, we are studying nutrition. So this is where, um, as you will hear later from uh, Kim, our dietitian, um, uh, venues like the specific carbohydrate diet um, are being studied intensely, and we have some positive results from, uh, from that. Um, and also improving uh, growth um, with our medications without steroids, because we know steroids can actually get in the way of proper growth. Again, makes it even a bigger deal to avoid steroids or avoid repeat use of steroids. So if you look at nutrition, anti-TNF antibodies, to some extent, uh, mercaptopurine methotrexate, to a lesser extent, I should say, we're able to get patients to be in remission, uh, to get healing, and to grow really well. So yes, we can achieve almost all of our goals, if not all of our goals, without steroids for the majority of patients, 
And I would say for uh, patients who need steroids, it makes it even more important that we always push to make sure that we not end up using more and more steroids. The next statement is on IBD and feeling blue and worrying all the time. It's just me. It's not anything but the fact that I might be anxious or uh, uh, depressed. Well, is this unrelated to the uh, disease or not? I would say that it's a, a myth that we should just dismiss uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression, as you heard from Dr. Cunningham's talk, as independent of the um, inflammation. And here's why. Um, we know that at least a third of our patients, and again, you heard um, details about this in Dr. Cunningham's uh, talk, at least a third of our patients have clear symptoms of anxiety and uh, depression. What was interesting is if you asked uh, the patients themselves, um, do you think that you're performing differently than your peers? Do you think that you feel different than your peers? Patients themselves, <coughs> excuse me, um, did not recognize that. But if you ask parents, parents recognize that. And then to Dr. Cunningham's point, if you were to look for symptoms by questionnaires or by working with an IBD psychologist, where in our center it's our philosophy that all patients should work with an IBD psychologist, you can really identify that at least a third, if not half, of our patients do have very obvious symptoms of anxiety and depression. Yes, sir. Is it Absolutely, and, and this is one of the things that we know, that chronic pain um, does not present like an individual with a, with a burst appendix. Chronic pain means that you may not, uh, may not actually express the fact that you have pain directly, as in I have pain, but you express it in either poor sleep, uh, change in performance, and anxiety, and depression. And that's the notion of chronic pain. And that's where we have to be trained as uh, providers taking care of patients with chronic conditions where pain is chronic, that we learn to identify what is pain as the surrogates of pain. And that's what you just suggested, performance change, uh, social isolation, uh, sleep disorders. And again, I would go back to Dr. Cunningham's talk. She outlined uh, in detail what these um, uh, uh, psychological aspects of IBD are. So um, it's important to recognize that it's not easy to tease out these symptoms directly from patients. And as, we, as we all know, for our adolescent patients, they want to be independent, they want their privacy, and IBD again breaks into that where you have us, parents, uh, relatives, friends, people who care um, about our kids, ask them all the time you know, uh, about their poops and about their uh, day and about their pain and again all the 15 or 16 year old young man and woman want to do is be private so um, it's important that we really try to tease this out um, and I always say to parents that you cannot be your child's therapist uh, leave that to your uh, managing uh, team and we have the expertise and skill to get to the bottom of that and also help our our kids manage their anxiety and or uh, depression now, um, anxiety and depression, we think, uh, have a lot of reasons to exist for a young man or woman with IBD. And that's because of, uh, number one, the inflammation that seems to be a, a strong driver uh, for the symptoms of anxiety and depression. In other words, for a lot of patients, addressing the inflammation uh, can reduce the symptoms a lot. Again, not in everybody. Um, but also the fact that the adolescent adolescent years are actually very difficult years emotionally, even without having IBD. So imagine adding that huge load of, load of IBD on top of the adolescent uh, years. And on top of that, uh, as, as any healthy young individual can go through, the stress that comes uh, within the family, the school, uh, social uh, bonding, uh, emotional growth, uh, it's a very cr critical time period. So. When these things all happen together, you can see where it could get out of hand and be overwhelming. And again, I, I want to stress actually uh, the point that you made that we have to look at the surrogates of these symptoms of anxiety and depression, uh, which could be social isolation, uh, sleep disorder, um, uh, chronic fatigue, uh, as an example. Um, the next statement, uh, taking IBD medicines will cause uh, cancer. Is this a myth or is this a reality? So I put my answer in between. Uh, and I, I think 
um, our philosophy again in our IBD center is to be very objective about quantifying risk. Nobody should ever sugarcoat um, a potential risk of a treatment plan. Uh, and at the same time, nobody should, um, there's no equivalent to sugarcoating, I guess, in that uh, phrase, but sugarcoating also the risk and over quantifying or under quantifying the risk that comes with uh, treatment. So do our IBD therapies um, have side effects? Absolutely. And perhaps, you know, you can argue that nutritional therapies are, um, you know, safer than the majority of uh, medications, which is a true statement. There is a lot of stress that comes with uh, nutrition therapy. And again, it's, it's not a fit for all. Uh, but IBD therapies, medical therapies, do come with their share of side effects. The more common side effects that we should always continue to pay attention to are uh, allergies uh, to different medications, liver inflammation, Fortunately, um, you know, the, you know, almost 100% of these allergies and liver irritation or liver inflammation are self-limiting and benign, and they may require dose adjustment or just not doing um, the, the medication going back to it again. Um, we know that all these medications work on uh, conceptually balancing the overactive immune system, but that also means that there's a risk of the immune system being uh, over weakened by these uh, treatments. And again, the number one medication that we worry about in this setting of suppressing the immune system would be steroids. Um, and uh, obviously other medications like the immune modulators, azathioprine, mercaptopurine, anti-TNF antibodies. Um, the, the observation that I can tell you I carry from, from my 13 years of being in the field is that when a medicine uh, partially works, that's when you see the majority of the side effects. And I think a medicine that partially works deserves to be looked at and maybe not continued. So that's, I think, one key thing to keep in mind. Where does the side effect really come up uh, at? Uh, these medicines can change the blood count, so that's why it's so important to monitor um, the patient's blood counts with blood tests routinely on a lot of these medications. Uh, skin changes. Um, we're seeing um, some skin reactions to different medications with time. Um, the cancer risk is there. Um, so if you look at the IBD population versus uh, the general population, there is a higher incidence of uh, cancer in the IBD population. I think we have to bring up um, uh, more common cancers than the most feared cancer, which is lymphoma, and I will talk about that in the next slide. But um, as simple as um, cautioning about sun exposure and sunburns, we know that, sun, that skin cancer is a major national um, health problem uh, because of the fact of uh, excess sun exposure. And uh, we don't caution our patients and we don't think about it as much as we think about lymphoma. We fear lymphoma more, but skin cancers might be a little more common. This is one question that keeps coming up, um, is that is the cancer risk because we closely follow our patients up, or is it a true, genuine increase in the cancer risk because of IBD itself, or is it a true uh, increased cancer risk because of the medication, or is it all of the above? Um, I think it's safe to leave it as um, there is a small increase in cancer risk with the IBD medications, and we will need a lot more time to quantify it exactly. But as you heard from Dr. Lee, and he really presented this very, very, very well, um, and he used a similar diagram to this. Uh, this diagram looks at the incidence of uh, lymphoma, which is cancer of the lymph nodes, um, in patients who have IBD. Um, and by default, that means patients with IBD who are being treated, because most patients with IBD, if not all patients with IBD, have received um, some uh, kind of treatment. Now, for all of us walking down the street, that risk of um, lymphoma would be um, one uh, um, in about uh, one to two out of 10,000 individuals. And that's no matter what walk of life we are, what kind of work we do, we just put the whole population together. This is our risk of uh, lymphoma. When um, you look at patients with IBD who are taking medications like azathioprine, uh, infliximab or Remicade or Humira or Simzia, the risk goes up from 2 in 10,000 to 6 in 10,000. Um, and when you look at that risk, it is a higher risk by all means. But if you look at all these numbers representing individuals who would take the medicine 
um, and benefit from it. Again, a medicine that partially works or does not work is a medicine that should not be continued. But if you take all the other patients who are doing well with the medicine who will not see the cancer risk, this is the, the flip side of the story that we always have to pay attention to. And I always have to keep reminding my uh, families that there is, in a way, a side effect of not treating uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And I also want to be aware of that, and that may approach 100%. And that's why I think treating it, uh, treating the disease and balancing the risk understanding is, is really exceptionally uh, important. Um, another you know, point to think about here is, so if a lymphoma happens in a patient um, with uh, IBD on treatment, um, does that mean that the lymphoma is um, life-threatening lymphoma all the time? Uh, well, no, not really, because the majority of lymphomas do have some treatment. And again, I don't want to belittle the fact that lymphoma is a big deal. However, this is not, in a way, a fatal uh, complication that um, cannot be uh, treated. And sometimes the treatments may actually help the IBD. So something to keep in mind there. I think it's important for us as providers to be very, very objective and um, you know, transparent about what we know about the risk. Again, uh, not to sugarcoat the risk in any direction here. Uh, the next statement is, I feel better, so I should stop my uh, medications. Is this a myth or a uh, reality? Uh, so this is a myth, and I think we all know this probably, this this crowd, I, I, you know, I don't think we need to re-emphasize re that, that. But the main reason why our medications do not work is uh, because we may not take them. Um, and as human nature dictates, if we feel great, it's really difficult to convince any of us human beings to do something to prevent something that may happen if we don't do that step. So pre preventative medicine is, uh, is in a way against our innate drive to just be and live day to day. But this is where our role as care providers and uh, parents of family, uh, par parents of children who have IBD is to keep reminding us ourselves is that there's a big value in controlling symptoms and disease today, but there's a bigger value in keeping the disease quiet. And I go back to uh, that slide that I showed you earlier, that this has to be our focus, especially in these formative years of 10 to 20 years. Um, and this is where these medicines come in handy. Again, I use medicine and diet included under that because uh, diet therapy can have the same effect as, as we've shown in a lot of patients. So this uh, treatment plan has its best value when it's working and when the disease is quiet. So other issues that come up, maybe the dose is inadequate, sh inadequate or treatment uh, course is too short or needing more than one treatment modality, diet plus something or two medicines instead of one. But really the bottom line for um, losing uh, efficacy of the treatment is not taking it uh, well. And taking a medicine again is a problem for most of our patients. Um, so we think it affects 50% of our patients, especially in adolescents. Again, you know, no adolescent wants his or her parents to be on their case. Take this pill, take that pill. Did you, you know, eat this or not eat that? Um, and again, in a in a spectrum of being overwhelmed by all the things that happened to that teenager with IBD, not having enough coping skills, and that's where I look at experts in IBD psychology, like Dr. Cunningham as life coaches, not for uh, us as providers and parents, but really for the patients themselves to be independ independently able to cope with all these variables around their IBD. And certainly depression can get in the way of um, being uh, proactive about taking uh, a medicine or following a diet plan. Um, and again, this is a good bittersweet point that when patients are in remission, they're less likely to continue taking the medicines. And again and again, that's where our role uh, comes in, and that's why we want to see our patients um, you know, three to four times a year, even when they're doing great, is to re-emphasize these, uh, th these points. This is a graph that shows that uh, if patients with ulcerative colitis um, stick with their medications, they're likely to stay in that remission close to 100%. And if they report taking part of their pills, on some of the days or not, you can see how the graph changes and the disease is way more likely to uh, act up. Now, the whole thing about stopping the medicines is not a, a concept that we're being very passive about um, on our end in our IBD center. I think um, that there is um, a strong uh, indication that for uh, certain patients with 
uh, deep healing of the lining of their intestine for a long enough period of time, there may be a window for those patients to de-escalate therapy. So either take less of a medicine or um, come off of the medicine um, uh, or switch from a medicine to a diet. And again, I bring up the specific carbohydrate diet as an example. It's fair to say that um, it, this is not something to look at as um, this happens for 100% of patients. And I think we have to be very selective as to you know, which patients should be going through this uh, or not. Um, and the concept is that uh, for some patients, especially if you pay attention to the disease early on and drive it into remission early on with minimal steroid use and keep it there for a longer period of time and prove that everything is healed. And at the right time when all these adolescent puberty processes are done and you have the capacity to explore things, which I encourage all my patients to do, it might be a good uh, a conversation to have with the provider to say, what can we do next? Um, it's an area of hot research. Um, obviously, generates a lot of emotions on everybody's mind. I can tell you that I'm always anxious about what would happen if the disease comes back, but I also like to empower my patients to decide for themselves and to know that they're not, in a way, owned by a treatment plan uh, for the rest of their lives. I don't believe in such a concept. Um, it may also drive a lot of anxiety on a parent's mind. Uh, what would happen if, again, things change? Um, but also, it weighs probably a lot on the patient's mind to say, well, I want to control my destiny in a way, and I want to explore that option. And sometimes that may carry so much value for that patient that we have to have our balance between these three uh, maybe competing uh, emotions that happen to all three involved parties in this equation. Um, but I want you to know that, you know, at our center at least, we do not keep a closed mind about we should not touch this conversation or, or that. There are times when you've told patients that it's probably not a good idea to explore. You may be now, maybe in three years, maybe in five years. Uh, instances where there's, for example, fistulizing disease or abscesses, uh, probably not a great idea to explore sooner than later. Um, but again, I would encourage all of us providers and parents to at least um, have that on their mind and bring it out to a discussion, because uh, I think every opinion should be heard um, when it comes to managing IBD. Uh, hand was up there. Absolutely, um, and I mean you've seen our, our you know incredibly inspiring uh, panel of uh, of uh, teenagers, and I think you can see also their perspective on IBD and how that changed. But I would think you know if uh, if I was taking care of any of these uh, young men and women when they were uh, ten, uh, would I want to explore you know something about their treatment plan when they're twelve or thirteen when they haven't even started to show you know puberty and growth or through their growth uh, spurt. I think that would be a potential risk of wasting their body's time at a very precious moment. Um, so uh, yes, past the puberty is the time to do it. Um, and again, you know, at least talking about it gives that um, uh, venue or maybe vocabulary to that patient to say, I know I can make decisions at the right time, that I'm not pretty much a uh, uh, sort of hostage to this treatment plan or to this provider telling me I have to do this or my parent telling me I have to do this forever. So I don't think there's a plan that uh, is forever. And I think the map is already changing a lot for IBD treatments and again exploring into diet therapies that we cannot look at IBD today the same way that we looked at it five years ago. Um, I have five minutes uh, to go so uh, I think I have four more slides. Um, uh, surgery should be avoided at all cost. I really think it's a myth. Um, as you know, surgery for Crohn's disease, when uh, Crohn's disease uh, starts to cause leaks or fistulas or abscesses, uh, in my opinion, it could be one of the best solutions to offer early to a patient. Um, and some patients may not need a treatment plan for years and years and years and years after. And just caution with uh, nutrition might be uh, the best way to go. And I would look at this, pa at this treatment plan for some patients as better than any medicines that I could uh, offer. And again, same thing with surgery for ulcerative colitis. As hard as it is sometimes to um, look at surgery, because surgery brings finality with it. If you take an organ out um, for colitis, uh, you cannot put it back in. But surgery, as you, as you saw probably for um, a lot of our kids, 
uh, really changes lives uh, in a very, very dramatic way. Um, and I think we should maybe change our conversation um, as uh, providers and as uh, parents, you know, in general, about how do we look at surgery. Surgery traditionally was looked at as failure of the medical therapy when I think surgery today at the right time, even early on, is the smartest decision a provider or a patient or a parent can do. Uh, I'll go back to this point. I will take a medicine for the rest of uh, my life, and I really think that this is a myth, not just for the points that I, uh, that I discussed about de-escalation of therapy, but about this. Um, this is a slide of um, a bacteria uh, called, bacterium called uh, Helicobacter pylori. And <coughs> before the 1990s, um, Helicobacter pylori was not known um, to be any uh, to play any meaningful role in the formation of stomach uh, or intestinal ulcers. So for centuries, uh, having a, a stomach ulcer uh, for about 25, 30% was uh, as good as a death sentence because these ulcers would uh, bleed, be complicated, be associated with uh, cancers. And um, I remember when I was in medical school, you know, in the, in the early 90s, you would still read about gastric uh, surgery dominantly for gastric ulcers that are bleeding. And it, this is horrific surgery, really, to go through. And what happened in the 19, uh, in late 18, uh, 1980s and uh, 1990s is a, a very uh, thorough uh, medical student uh, who was studying um, a pathology, I believe, was looking at uh, these slides from patients with uh, stomach ulcers time and again and notice that there were tiny, 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 tiny dots in a lot of these slides, and uh, time and again uh, kept digging into that, and then eventually described the fact that the uh, bacteria was living in the stomach of individuals who developed uh, stomach ulcers, and that when you eradicated the bacteria before the ulcer gets to a, um, a complicated stage that would traditionally acquire surgery, uh, or lead to fatal complications, that you could actually take that risk uh, to almost zero if treated at the right time with the right combination. So in the span of a few years, uh, this condition that was lifelong untreatable with uh, medications for a good significant portion of patients, this condition was changed from a horrible condition to a curable condition. And it didn't take 20 years or 30 years or 50 years. It took a few years, and of course there were there was doubt and there was denial at first, and you know uh, scientific experiment proved that this was unquestionable today, and I think it's only a matter of time until we have our moment when we have a clear reason why IBD happens, and a very very clear way to cure it and prevent it. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. What's the, uh, the youngest age that someone can be diagnosed with IBC? Um, so in general, below the age of three or four, uh, the line between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis gets a little blurry. Uh, so you, you, we get a lot of uh, unclassified or indeterminate uh, uh, colitis or Crohn's disease. Uh, but it has been reported in uh, uh, kids as young as even two weeks. Now, what we also uh, keep in mind is the younger our kids are with IBD, whether it's colitis or Crohn's disease, there's a higher chance of finding a specific immune deficiency. Uh, if there's a specific immune deficiency, we know now that for certain immune deficiencies, they can be cured with a stem cell transplant, so you can actually cure IBD in that very specific uh, instance. Um, so. Um, it could present in the first year of life, but again, that's where we'd look for immune deficiencies that have an overlapping picture with, uh, with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Thank you. I have a question. When do you start the bone density testing? Is that something that you test for when you think they're remission, or do you do a baseline on that? Um, so you'll hear different opinions, and uh, uh, the majority of us would get it either uh, at diagnosis or within a year or two of diagnosis. Um, I don't think it's a right or wrong here, but as long as it's done, you know, within that time frame from diagnosis. The idea is we want to get a baseline. Um, if the baseline proves to be um, low, 
then we have to go back and look at our goals for uh, treatment. Remember, we talked about remission and what that means. Um, and the biggest driver for loss of bone density in IBD is the active inflammation. So I go back and make sure that I'm on top of treating the inflammation and getting to that stage of deeper uh, healing. And the second factor would be nutrition, focus on vitamin D and focus on um, uh, calcium intake. And one caution is that you know calcium does not mean dairy. Uh, there are a lot of non-dairy sources of calcium and it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, and the third component is physical activity and Teresa talked about that, that we wanna stimulate the bone strength by tensing the bones and that means contracting muscles and that means physical activity. So these are, these are the three things that we do. And that's where we sort of have these conversations about checking it earlier or later. But as long as it's checked within the first couple of years of diagnosis, that's a that's an acceptable practice. Oh. All right, so I think we'll uh, get going with our next uh, talk. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce my uh, wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Matthew uh, Giefer. Uh, Dr. Giefer is the director of our therapeutic endoscopy and uh, pancreas disorder program. Um, he brings a massive uh, degree of pediatric interventional expertise, which is really important to us in pediatric gastroenterology and in IBD as well. Um, and um, Dr. Giver is going to talk about the uh, manifestations of IBD that happen outside of outside of the gut. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you will find it uh, important and interesting. And we had some questions from the crowd earlier about. Uh, the joints in uh, IBD. So, Dr. Giefer. All right. So, I'll be talking about a bunch of different extraintestinal manifestations of IBD today. And the main point I wanted to start with is that, yes, we're all GI specialists, and yes, many of the questions that we ask you and your children during the appointments relate to the function of their bowels and their intestines, but we don't just care about that. We care about all of them, and you're much more than the sum of your intestines. So extraintestinal manifestations of IBD are very common. So about a third of patients that are diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease will have some type of extraintestinal manifestation. And we really think of them as falling into three different categories. So there are some manifestations that are directly related to the disease activity. Joint issues are one of the most common ones. Um, and those issues tend to go away when the intestinal inflammation is under control. There's another category of extraintestinal diseases that um, are present in IBD but don't seem to correlate with the degree or severity of the intestinal inflammation. And there's a specific liver condition that I'll talk about during this presentation. That's one of the best examples of that. And there's a third uh, group of issues that can relate to therapy. So yes, they can involve other organ systems besides the intestine. But those complications or those issues uh, can be a direct response to some of the medications or the therapies that we use. So I just wanted to go over a list, and as you can see, it's long. So there are many areas outside of the body, and many of them can be affected by inflammatory bowel disease. So weight loss and abnormal growth, fevers, joint issues, bone issues, skin, eye, and liver problems, pancreatitis or pancreas issues, bladder and kidney problems, blood cell issues, particularly related to red blood cells and platelets, and the hands, mouth, and even mood are often affected in inflammatory bowel disease. So we'll, we'll take these one at a time. The first is growth, and growth failure or problems with normal growth is seen in about a quarter of Crohn's disease and about 10% of ulcerative colitis. And for Crohn's disease, the underlying cause of that growth problem or growth failure can be related to multiple different factors. Undernutrition or poor absorption, uh, poor appetite. Um, there's also steroid use and that medication can direct, directly affect growth. There's also a role of some of those inflammatory molecules, we call them cytokines. So when a cell is inflamed, it tends to release certain substances into the bloodstream and those travel throughout the whole body and the effect of that can uh, be changes to growth. In ulcerative colitis, um, many of those issues are at play, but a, a big issue in ulcerative colitis is the degree of uh, steroid exposure that can affect growth. Puberty is also an important thing that's brought up a few times today. And it's important to remember that girls tend to have the onset of puberty a little bit younger than boys do. So the average girl begins in pubertal changes between ages 10 and 14. And for boys, it's between 12 and 16. 
And if that's delayed significantly, um, it's usually in conjunction with poor growth, but that's another red flag for active inflammatory bowel disease. I don't know if you can see those red dots on the growth curve that's on the right-hand side of the screen, but this is a representation of a, a patient who is having growth measurements uh, tracked throughout childhood. And what children tend to do is, during the first year, there can be changes, changes in their percentiles. So they may start out and be born at the 90th percentile, but then settle out to kind of the percentile curve that they're going to track through throughout childhood. And as you can see, this child settled out around the 50th percentile, maybe a little bit above. And then right about in the middle of the, of the graph is when growth changed. And there wasn't a lot of weight loss, but you see that the percentiles change. So the child went from above the 50th to the 50th and then below and didn't really put on much weight for this period of time. And that led to a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, which was treated and the intestinal inflammation improved. And then you can see that there was some pretty significant changes to growth after that. And the child, by the end of this period, was tracking almost back on the curve where they would have been even before the diagnosis was made. Another important extra-intestinal manifestation is fever, but that's one of the most confusing and the most difficult one to kind of pin down. And there's actually been some more recent data in the last 20 or 30 years that changed one of our preconceived notions. So if you ask the random person wandering down the street, what's the average body temperature, they'll say 98.6. It turns out that that's a lot more variable than that and that the average body temperature can change by more than a degree throughout the day. So that means that healthy adolescents that aren't fighting any infection, have no cold, can have body temperatures of, temperatures of up to 99.9 .9 in the morning. Now, if you have reliable body temperatures over 100, that is a diagnosis of fever, and that can be a sign of many things. It can most commonly be a, just a transient illness, you know, a brief cold. And we're all used to having you know, the snotty nose or sore throat or ear infection fevers. But we think that we fight viruses or more subtle infections commonly. And many times, those subtle fevers can happen without any sign of an active infection. But active inflammatory bowel disease is an important underlying cause of fevers for some patients and does directly correlate with the active inflammation. So persistent fevers above 100 degrees can be a sign of active inflammation in the intestine. So joints, um, I mentioned that they're one of the most common extra-intestinal manifestations. And we think about joint disorders in, in two kind of groups. One is peripheral. That means your arms and legs, so um, wrists, elbows, shoulders, knees, ankles. Um, tends to be those larger joints rather than smaller joints like fingers or toes. But there can often be swelling and redness of those joints during times of active inflammation. And that tends to go away when the inflammation is under better control. There's another group that we call axial um, joints, and those predominantly refer to the spine. Um, there are some spine changes that can happen with active inflammatory bowel disease, and the most common one of those is called ankylosing spondylitis. Um, it's actually a, a disorder that's pretty rare in children and more common in adults with long-term inflammatory bowel disease. But as you can see on this little picture in the lower right-hand side, there are these, the bones of your spine, which are the vertebra, and then there are these discs uh, between them that are uh, cushions or cartilaginous cushions that kind of protect us as we walk and allow us our mobility. And it's right kind of at the junction of those discs and the bones that inflammation can happen. Bones have been brought up a few times uh, today, and there are a few things to kind of think about. First is osteopenia. So as Dr. Wabe mentioned, the childhood years and adolescent years are a very important time for laying down that bone mineral that we'll have for the rest of our lives. And this x-ray, there's not a comparison one, but you may notice that some of the bones, this is of the knees and uh, the thigh bone and then the lower leg bones here, uh, they're a little more black than you would expect to see. Um, you know, here is more normal, but in this region here, this region here, and in the lower legs, you notice that it's not quite as white as it's meant to be. Um, so that's consistent with the low bone mineral density. We have a different uh, test that's actually more sensitive at picking this up called a DEXA scan, which is a bone density scan that helps us track and follow this. Um, bone density 
problems can be certainly related to poor absorption of vitamins and minerals. They can be related to active intestinal inflammation. And it's also directly related to puberty. So we know that children with delayed puberty due to inflammatory bowel disease often have delayed bone density. Um, and sometimes teasing apart what part of that low bone density is due to delayed puberty, what part may be due to intestinal inflammation is difficult. So they'll often do a, a particular x-ray of um, another part of the body to try to establish that someone's bone age when they're doing a bone density scan. There's also another condition that's pretty rare called aseptic necrosis. So aseptic means without infection and necrosis means death of a particular tissue. So some people with inflammatory bowel disease can have um, very painful lesions that are due to loss of blood supply to a particular area of the bone. Thankfully, that's very uncommon. Uh, skin, sorry for those of you that are a little squeamish, um, some of these pictures, skin and the eyes are the ones that tend to affect me the most, but um, there are some skin issues that are related to inflammatory bowel disease that we need to keep in mind as well. The two that are a sign of active intestinal inflammation, one is called pyoderma gangrenosum and the other is called erythema nodosum. So this middle picture is of pyoderma and that's where you can get these kind of punched out lesions, almost like ulcers um, that ten, can be quite deep on the skin and most commonly involving the legs. And then erythema nodosum doesn't have the ulcers, but you can see some kind of blue purple discolorations uh, to the skin. And again, that tends to, to happen on the leg. Very different from bruises. Um, these aren't commonly mistaken for bruises because bruises tend to happen along the shin bone or right at the knee. And this tends to be more diffuse throughout the leg. There's also another class of uh, skin problems that can be related to particular medication side effects. Um, the most common one is something called pustular psoriasis. Uh, this is a picture of the scalp. And right in this region here, you can see some kind of red, crusty, kind of raised lesions. Um, it can affect other areas of the body too, but the scalp is the most common area. It can affect the arms, legs, hands, um, particularly the back of the hands. Um, and that complication or that uh, issue is often noticed with uh, some medications like Remicade and Humira, but thankfully can usually be controlled by topical therapies. So the eyes. Um, there are three different eye disorders that can be associated with IBD. Um, medically, they're called uveitis, episcleritis, and keratitis. So uveitis is, almost think of it as like a bloodshot eye. Um, you can see you know, pretty predominant vessels um, that are all surrounding the colored part of the eye. Episcleritis tends to be more focal. So you know, there's a lot of redness that's you know, just next to, above, or below, or to the side of the colored part of the eye. And sometimes that's also associated with um, actual ulcers on the, the white part of the eye. Although in this picture, the person doesn't have an ulcer, just very focal redness. And then keratitis or keratin is an um, important component of pretty much all the coverings in our body. So skin, eyes, um, and there's a particular condition called keratitis where some of that keratin can be deposited or put down in higher concentrations in the eye. And you can end up with these um, little kind of whitish um, projections that can sometimes go over the dark part of the eye. No, no, it's not. Um, so the next is liver. Um, the liver is a very large and important organ in our body that most of us aren't aware as to what it's doing every day because it filters all of the blood that's coming back from the intestine. So our heart pumps blood to the intestine where it goes into the lining of the intestine and helps us absorb the nutrients from the food that we eat and keep the intestinal lining healthy. And then all of that blood, when it comes back, before it goes to the heart, it goes through the liver. And the liver absorbs toxins, it absorbs nutrients. Um, it's very important in the immune functioning of the body because many bacteria and viruses uh, come from the intestine. And the liver um, performs a very important role in filtering out those um, bacteria, those viruses, as well as metabolic roles. So it helps us maintain our blood sugar. Um, 
And it also creates a substance called bile. So bile is the greenish, brownish substance that makes our poop the color that it is. And bile is made by the liver every day, and it makes a lot. It makes almost a liter of bile, or a quarter of a gallon of bile every day. And that's usually excreted from the liver, and then it drains into the intestine. These, this little picture um, on the right shows what normal bile ducts look like. So there are all these normal liver cells here, and they're making bile that's picked up by the bile ducts, and then that drains into the intestine. There's a particular condition that's associated with inflammatory bowel disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis. It's a long word, so we often call it PSC. Um, and PSC causes these narrowings or kind of like almost a beaded appearance to these drainage systems from the liver. Um, and sometimes can cause obstruction, not allowing the bile to get into the intestine like it's supposed to. And it's a small subset of patients, about three to five percent of those with inflammatory bowel disease get this condition called PSC. Um, and it tends to be associated with colonic disease mostly. So those that have Crohn's disease that just affects the small intestine are at the lowest risk for getting um, PSC, but those with UC or Crohn's colitis are at the three to five percent chance of getting uh, PSC over the course of their life. And this is one of the conditions that doesn't seem directly related to the disease activity. So, you know, even if the intestinal inflammation is under excellent control, people can still get some of these liver changes over time. The reason I, I bring that up is that this is one condition, I'll talk more about some of the screening that we, that we do in the future, but um, this is one condition that is important to be followed or looked for, and we have very good tests just from the routine blood tests that we send that can pick up whether or not this might be becoming an issue or not. There are other liver conditions which can be related to inflammatory bowel disease, but they're less common than the PSC. So uh, elevated enzymes um, or elevated liver function tests can sometimes be seen. Steatosis is just a fancy way of saying fat in the liver. So sometimes there can be um, excess deposits of fat in the liver seen with inflammatory bowel disease. And then gallbladder diseases are, are common in general. So most of us um, probably know somebody in their family or friend group that has had some gallbladder issue. Uh, gallstones and gallbladder inflammation are both common just in otherwise healthy people, but are slightly more common in those that have inflammatory bowel disease. So the pancreas is another somewhat vague uh, gland that not many people are aware of on a daily basis, but the pancreas, um, it's a gland and it secretes uh, secretions, just like our salivary glands or our tear glands. Um, but the pancreas is much larger than any of those and it tends to lie kind of just below and behind the stomach, uh, right across the midline of the, of the body. And the two functions of the pancreas, one is to help with digestion, so digestion. Uh, so it makes a bunch of enzymes that help us break apart fat and protein and sugars into things that we can absorb. And it also um, releases things like insulin into the bloodstream to help us regulate our blood sugars. Um, acute pancreatitis, or pancreatitis in general, is inflammation of the pancreas. And that can happen for no good reason, um, but tends to happen more commonly in people that have inflammatory bowel disease. And some of that is thought to be due to maybe some of the medicines that we use. Um, azathioprine and 6 mercaptopurine have um, uh, occasional side effects of causing irritation or inflammation to the pancreas. Um, and there's also an, another condition called autoimmune pancreatitis. So just like inflammatory bowel disease is a type of autoimmune condition, there's a type of autoimmune pancreatitis where people can have recurrent episodes of pancreatitis. Uh, thankfully, the uh, symptoms for this don't tend to be vague. Um, the symptoms for pancreatitis tend to be pretty abrupt onset, very severe abdominal pain that's different from that that anyone's ever experienced before. It tends to be in the upper belly. It may radiate to the back, uh, or sometimes back pain. There's often a lot of vomiting. And the pain doesn't come and go. It tends to come on pretty abruptly and get severe hour by hour. Um, and it often does require admission to the hospital when it's severe because when people have that type of severe pain, particularly if they're vomiting, uh, they may need IV pain medicines and they may need help with hydration, like with IV fluids. 
and the symptoms tend to resolve pretty quickly, usually within a few days. And if someone with inflammatory bowel disease has been on one of those medicines, azathioprine, 6-MP, at the time that they get pancreatitis, we may often discontinue it. So the, the bladder and the kidneys receive about 25% of all the blood that our heart pumps every minute. Um, the kidneys filter that blood and help us balance our electrolytes and our fluid status. And for those that have inflammatory bowel disease, there's a higher risk of developing kidney stones, as well as two other conditions that aren't directly related to the filtering or the action of the kidneys, but more related to the intestinal inflammation. So the intestine and the kidneys and their drainage systems all lie in the belly. And on this middle picture, you know, you can imagine just the intestines kind of overlying all of these organs. And if the intestinal inflammation or scarring related to that um, affects the ureters, those are the drainage tubes that come out of the kidneys, sometimes those can get blocked and that causes kind of stretching out or dilation of one of the kidneys. Um, and it's also possible, although rare, for the intestinal inflammation to actually connect to the bladder because the bladder lies um, right behind or below uh, much of the intestines. Um, and sometimes the, in complicated inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease, um, there can become uh, communications or fistulas, we call them, between the, the bladder and the intestine. Um, Blood is a complex substance. It has many different types of cells in it. Red blood cells are uh, an important one, and certainly anemia is common in inflammatory bowel disease. That tends to be due to multiple different factors, but uh, important factors include um, a person's iron status and then vitamin status. So folate and vitamin B12, um, along with iron, are very important substances that have to be in our body in order for them to make enough red blood cells. And when your body can't make enough, those that are there tend to have less iron in them. And these, this top picture, you can see they look more like donuts than they do discs. So in the lower picture is a normal blood smear where you see healthy red blood cells. But these are a little more pale, and you can see that there's more central kind of whiteness to those red blood cells, and that's a sign of iron deficiency. Um, platelet counts can be both high and low in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, when it's high, we call it thrombocytosis, and when it's low, we call it thrombocytopenia. And platelets are important for um, functioning of clots. So every time we, we cut ourselves, um, or if there's intestinal inflammation um, with bleeding, platelets can be important in, in stopping that bleeding. But there's a, a separate condition that's somewhat related to the platelet function, but um, I listed it here as hypercoagulable. So people with inflammatory bowel disease are at a higher risk for getting blood clots. Um, part of that's relating to the platelets, but more of it is relating to the inflammation that's all around the body. And when the body is inflamed, it's more likely to clot. Um, the reason that this becomes important is, is often when we're doing things that increase the risk of clot and the biggest risky thing that we sometimes have to do is do semi-permanent or permanent central lines. So people that have a lot of active inflammation in their intestine, if they have uh, something foreign in the middle of a blood vessel like a central line, uh, we have to pay special attention to making sure that that doesn't get clot or that there aren't associated clots around that line. Um, the next one is uh, somewhat weird. So finger clubbing, I don't know how many of you have heard of this. It can happen for many different reasons, and now everyone's going to look at their finger, I'm sure. Um, so the fingernail typically, as this picture on the left shows, kind of ends at the tip of the finger. In some people, it bends all the way over and ends more in the middle part of the finger, and then the angle from the finger to the nail can sometimes be greater than 180 degrees. So when you've got that fingernail that's kind of ending in the middle of the finger rather than the tip and the bend uh, between the finger and the nail being over 180 degrees, we call that finger clubbing. Um, that too is a sign of, an, of just inflammation. So there's many other conditions that can cause finger clubbing, but all of those have increased body inflammation. 
So because inflammatory bowel disease can increase your body inflammation, it can cause some of these changes to the fingers. Um, the mouth is an extension of the GI tract. So you can get ulcers uh, like this tongue ulcer or back of the throat ulcer in inflammatory bowel disease, particularly Crohn's. And you can also get something called chelitis, which are this kind of dry, cracked, um, red lips, or particularly the corners of the mouth uh, that can form with active inflammatory bowel disease. The last one I just want to mention, I know it's been talked about a few times, is mood. Um, because we often try to disassociate these things. Um, you know, we're obviously only aware of what's going on in our mind and less aware of what's happening in our body on most days. Um, but the mind, just like any other organ that I've talked about, is often affected by inflammatory bowel disease. So um, some studies have said a third of patients, I found one that said up to half of people with active inflammatory bowel disease have issues with anxiety or depression at that time. And then that number tends to drop significantly, although not normalize, um, when disease is under better control. And going back to the cytokines that I talked about earlier, uh, it's important to remember that these have direct effect on the functioning of the nerves in our brain. So those same little kind of inflammatory molecules that are released by the intestine that can cause some of these other effects that I was mentioning, when they make it up to the brain, they actually affect that the, the way that those nerves conduct their regular signals. Um, in addition to that inflammatory effect on the mind, there are some treatment-related treatment, treatment related effects, and the biggest one of those is steroids. All right, so that was a long list. And the big question I'm sure going through your minds is, oh my god, how do I know if I or my child has one of these conditions? Um, and the point that I wanted to make is that we look for them. Um, and they're relatively easy to screen for and look for. So every time um, you see your IBD care team, we're looking on physical exam for any of these findings or any of these signs of extra intestinal things going on. And our physical exam can pick up lots of stuff, including all of these conditions that I mentioned here on the left. Sometimes physical exam isn't enough, and we need some other lab tests or imaging to um, pick up issues that are going on. So we often will check the liver function uh, tests as a part of our regular lab draws. Um, bones can be evaluated by the DEXA scans or the bone density scans. Um, pancreas issues, bladder, kidney issues, and blood cells all picked up on, on lab tests. And then treatments. I've been emphasizing this as I, as I went through, but almost all of these extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease improve or resolve as we treat the inflammation. So priority number one is almost always getting the intestinal inflammation under control while we're screening for these um, complications or these uh, effects outside of the intestine. And then sometimes, if, even if we find them, the, you know, we would keep an eye on them and we keep monitoring the function of that organ, but the primary therapy or the primary way to get it better would be to still treat the inflammatory bowel disease. And then some of these conditions, as I mentioned, like the PSC condition, do require some specific monitoring and treatment aside from the inflammatory bowel disease. Thank you very much. Are there any questions before Kim? Sure. Yeah, so when you guys were looking, uh, testing for liver stuff, like 6 MD, are you looking for the liver function, or do you look for like the leftover remnants of the drug, or how do you? So we're usually looking for the liver function itself. And it's um, not always related to therapy. So we routinely check liver function tests. The um, exact frequency of how often we check that varies. But we're not just screening for um, side effects of the medicines. It's actually looking for underlying conditions. Um, some medicines give us very mild elevations of the liver function tests. Methotrexate is one of the most common ones. Um, so we can detect you know, mild abnormalities to some of these liver function tests. Um, but those are almost expected and don't cause long-term problems. All right, thanks. It's my great pleasure to introduce the last speaker uh, for today, and that's Kim uh, Brawley. Uh, Kim is uh, an incredible addition to our team, uh, and she joined us. feels like forever, but I know it's not forever. It's been a year uh, and a half, maybe, two. 
So two years ago, and um, we could not be luckier because uh, Kim's primary focus um, has been on uh, nutrition therapies in uh, IBD. As we all know, this is a huge area of uh, focus now in terms of utilizing nutrition in reducing inflammation, uh, inducing remission, um, and maintaining remission. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, facets to this from uh, what's balanced nutrition, what's nutrition as therapy, and what's really just being on a diet. Um, Kim works with practically all of our patients who have uh, IBD at some point in time from diagnosis to later. And uh, I could not think of a better person to educate us a little more today about nutrition therapy versus diet in pediatric IBD. Kim. Thanks, Dr. Wabe. So I'm excited to discuss today and to discuss with you all nutrition therapy versus diet and pediatric IBD. Um, this area is very exciting, but it's also very evolving. Um, and it's of interest among scientists and amongst the community for us um, and where this will take us in the future. Some of it may be repeat from what you've kind of heard bits and pieces. So I'm just going to recap some things today. And I always think repeat is good because then it sticks a little bit. So we're a little over time, so I apologize if we're running a bit late. If you have pressing questions, feel free to raise your hand, but I'll also be here after the presentation too to answer questions. Our case today opens with a 15-year-old male, JB, and no, it's not Justin Bieber. <laughs> Just kidding. He has a new diagnosis of IBD, and he presented with bloody stool, weight loss, and stomach pain. His initial meeting with the dietitian indicated in his diet history that he had a poor appetite, which is very common, um, and he was only drinking protein shakes as that's what helped him feel the best. And this may sound familiar with some of you guys. Our goals today will to briefly review um, nutrition background in IBD, discuss nutrition as therapy, review how nutrition therapy kind of affects IBD, and then we'll transition to diet and diet recommendations in IBD. And then we will review cultural diets and trends that we've seen over the past several years. We've discussed kind of what Crohn's disease is and what ulcerative colitis is today, so we'll specifically focus on the nutrition part. As Dr. Giefer mentioned, weight loss is very common, and in Crohn's disease, 60 to 90 percent of patients experience weight loss. Micronutrient deficiencies are also very common, and those are the vitamins and minerals that we need to, for our body to function well. And then bone loss is very common, which we've heard today as well. In contrast, ulcerative colitis, weight loss is seen in 20 to 50% of our population. But there's also a tendency to have increased electrolyte losses, spe specifically potassium, chloride, and sodium. And bone loss is also common. So a quick view at our GI tract, right? We have our small intestine here, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. We won't, you don't need to memorize those. And then the large intestine, our colon. So things that I'm looking at when I do a diet history review are, and based on the labs that all of our team looks at are, as Dr. Giefer mentioned, iron. Most of our patients have iron deficiency anemia or anemia of chronic disease just from the inflammation. And we oftentimes will treat the anemia after that acute kind of inflammatory response is under control. Calcium is a big one that we don't necessarily see on labs, but we do pick up on the DEXA scans that Dr. Giefer mentioned. Um, and unfortunately, and fortunately, the biggest source of calcium in the diet is through dairy. Um, Dr. Wabe mentioned that dairy come, you know, calcium can come in other food sources. However, it is best absorbed through dairy, and we oftentimes have to avoid dairy with inflammatory bowel disease as it can kind of worsen our symptoms. Folate is another um, nutrient deficiency that's seen, especially as it's a side effect of some medications. Um, sulfasalazine and methotrexate can result in folate deficiency, and so our providers will always supplement with folic acid. Vitamins A, E, K, and D are primarily absorbed in the jejunum, so that middle section of the small intestine. And vitamin D is of particular interest. Most of us are deficient because of where we live, so we all could take some. But because of that inflammation and the kind of bone disease that naturally occurs with IBD, um, we will check usually and oftentimes supplement at higher levels. And it's important to stay on top of because of the bone loss that we see. 
And vitamin B12 is very important. It comes from animal sources of protein. Um, and it's absorbed in the ileum. And oftentimes with Crohn's disease, we'll, we'll have inflammation in the ileum, whether it's the terminal ileum you may hear. And some kids need resection of that portion of the bowel. And so we will check, and I think this will be an area that we grow in checking as well, um, this vitamin to see if we need to supplement it. It's important for neurologic function, um, for things that we do on a daily basis. And lastly, um, water and electrolytes are absorbed in the colon, and that's of particular um, importance, especially with um, ulcerative colitis when one is in a flare, because they have such um, large amounts of water loss and electrolyte losses, sometimes we have to supplement those. Here we're back to this Venn diagram. You guys have this memorized yet? We've established that um, we don't know exactly how IBD occurs, but we know there's a genetic portion of um, how it evolves in a genetically predisposed person with likely kind of an altered microbiome as Dr. Um, Suskin mentioned this morning. And then the immune response may be compromised to some degree. We'll be focusing on environmental aspects and separate from what Dr. Cunningham mentioned, um, we know that we've seen a rise in antibiotic use, which may play a role as kind of a trigger. Um, we know that stress and environmental factors that have to deal with emotions can affect inflammation. And then lastly, we'll focus on is the diet. So standard treatment we've heard today includes um, medication management, wh and medications which suppress the immune system and or treat the inflammation. Pros to this treatment involve that the symptoms are reduced and the inflammation can go away. We oftentimes see improvement of weight, especially in our um, pediatric patients. And then the downside to medications are that it does not affect those underlying triggers, which we saw on the last slide. Um, there may be an increased risk, you know, there's side effects, cancer being one of them, that could happen, very small chance. There's a risk of infection when one is immunosuppressed, and there may be an, a negative impact on growth, linear growth in particular, especially with steroids. So I wanted to make sure to break down um, the presentation today. The first two, as I mentioned, two kind of sections, will be discussing nutrition specifically as a therapy, so similar to medication as a therapy. And one of the worldly, worldwide accepted therapies is exclusive enteral nutrition. And has everyone heard of this in here? Most people, some, well, is it new to some? Awesome. So nutrition, or exclusive enteral nutrition, I'll call it EEN, involves um, a diet that consists of 100% of a commercial formula, like Boost or Insure or Pediasure. It can be taken by mouth, um, or it can be taken through a feeding tube that goes through your nose and into the stomach. As you can imagine, that could be very challenging, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. There's also partial enteral nutrition, or PEN, when one receives part of their calories from a diet and the rest coming from um, the formula. Research on EEN as IBD therapy um, is reaffirming, and there has been quite a bit of it over the past 10, 20 years. Um, primarily, it's been compared to steroids as an induction therapy, meaning that to treat that initial response. And we learned probably today that there's maintenance therapies that can help keep one in remission. So it's been used as the induction therapy in pediatrics. Um, one study in particular, Borelli, in 2006, they did a great study, um, that group, comparing steroids to EEN, and they found that the steroid, or the EEN was equal to steroids in inducing and bringing one into remission. They, um, the kids on EEN had improved bone density, and they had improved linear growth. And then they also experienced greater mucosal healing, and as Dr. Wabe mentioned, that's an essential part of maintaining and keeping one in remission for long, longer term. Dr. Levine in Israel in 2014, so just recently, um, compared 47 patients. Most of them were actually pediatric patients and then some were adults. Um, he put the pa uh, one group of patients onto an oral supplement diet with that commercial formula and then onto a regular food. So they were kind of doing the 50-50 mixture. And then the other group only did um, a prescribed diet of regular foods, but they had a lot of excluded foods as well. 
and results showed that remission was achieved in 70% of the pediatric patients and 69% of the adult patients after six weeks of being on the therapy. And this is significant because traditionally, PEN has not been shown to be as effective as EEN, and so we may grow in the area of being able to incorporate some regular foods when one is on this therapy, which would be huge for our pediatric patients who drinking oral supplements for eight to 12 weeks is just a daunting task, and for any of us for that matter, and they, they inspire me every day by doing this therapy. Pros and cons of EEN are, um, and the advantage it has is that it prevents and treats nutrient deficits. One's getting a nutri nutritionally complete formula with calcium, vitamin D, um, carbohydrates, fats, protein. You see improvement of growth and sexual development, oftentimes because of the, the weight gain. Um, it can prevent and reverse bone loss, decrease the use of steroids. It's safe, and we can see improved mu mucosal healing. Challenges of EEN are the taste and the impact on daily living that it has. Compliance is an issue, especially actually with adults. On average, 40% of adults fail to comply to this therapy. But children, however, up to 90% of compliance has been reported. Many do require a feeding tube if they're willing. Um, the cost is a, an issue sometimes. Insurance does not cover this therapy yet. In Europe, it's one of the primary induction therapies that they do. Um, and it's still kind of growing in the United States. Insurance as a whole doesn't cover, cover it like they would steroids. And then the social challenge is significant. Kids having to drink a formula in front of their peers, they're asking, why are you on this diet? And they don't want to explain. So how does EEN work? Well, that is a great question. We are still figuring out, but there are theories. One is we s presume that it's, it may be because there's a consistent intake of this formula. So there's a set amount of maybe harmful things that one is consuming, and there's a set amount of the harmful things that one is avoiding by food avoidance in general. And we'll talk more about that. Um, we know that in, within 24 hours of diet change, the gut microbiome also changes, like Dr. Suskin mentioned. So on this therapy, the gut biome totally changes. Um, and it may have a direct anti-inflammatory effect as well. We'll next transition to diets, specifically general diet recommendations for IBD and a review of cultural diets and trends. But I'm interested to know how many of you um, have tried Googling diet in IBD. Just raise your hands. Have most men, I would say over 50%. Um, and what are some things that you find? Like feel free to shout out what you've read or. Yeah, like fecal transplant. Yeah, that's a good one. Any other diets that have popped up that people? Well, we'll jump into some. When I Google diet and IBD, I kind of term this term fad diets because oftentimes they do coincide with what's going on and what's popular in the media. And it's also overwhelming. The paleo diet pops up, FODMAPS diet pops up, the specific carbohydrate diet, a gluten-free diet. Families come in and they'll have questions about what foods are bad, what should they eat, and what should kids avoid. Um, some questions include turmeric, what about omega-3 fatty acids, what about probiotics, is sugar bad? Evidence-based dietary guidelines are lacking as a whole, and nutrition research has received relatively minimal attention compared to medicines over the years. This is hopefully going to change them. And frequently families come in to see me and they're exhausted and overwhelmed and just feeling I can't take any more information right now. So standard diet counseling, again, there's no evidence behind this, but what we generally counsel on um, is a nutritionally complete diet, right? So everyone should have a nutritionally complete diet, but I find that this is especially important to discuss with each patient that's diagnosed with IBD, and I feel so fortunate to be able to work at our IBD center and have the privilege of meeting all of your kids um, and all the kids that come in, into our door here. Um, this includes adequate hydration, daily multivitamin for kids that maybe hate vegetables or fruits, very common, um, chewing your food thoroughly, avoiding nuts, seeds, or popcorn, especially for fistulizing disease and strictures, and then avoiding excessive dietary restrictions, which is hard. And this is important to discuss with families because kind of the innate and the natural response with IBD is to feel hungry 
But then once one starts eating in a flare, they say, mm, no, I'm not feeling as well. And I see more ki every kid that comes through the door to some degree has experienced this feeling. So we counsel on what's called the flare diet, and it's more to control symptoms. And it's not the same for every one person. 50% of people with Crohn's disease have lactose intolerant, but another 50% may not. So we, and as generally speaking, we recommend to avoid excessive fat through greasy and fried foods, high fat meats, avoid excessive sugar through sodas, juice, and other sweetened beverages and desserts like concentrated sweets, and then choosing lactose-free dairy products when in a flare, again. And then limiting or avoiding high fiber foods in special circumstances. Um, and again, some kids may say, yeah, if I eat raw fruits and vegetables, I have increased stool output, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the disease is worse, just their symptoms. So these can be helpful tools to have. And now to transition to the specific carbohydrate diet. So I put this under diets. However, research is evolving, and we've done some research here at Seattle Children's Hospital as well. The theory behind this diet is that carbohydrates affect the fecal microbiome, which is felt to be the major kind of trigger of IBD, one of the components. Another theory that we're finding as a trend is that this diet also removes processed foods. The diet lacks rigorous research in large studies. The pros of the diet are that it uses whole foods rather than a commercial formula, so kids can still eat with their friends. Um, and then the downside is the time that the diet takes to prepare meals, and families spend hours on this diet preparing, very diligent families, and the social strains that it puts. Diet eliminations, which we try to avoid, especially in pediatric patients that need to be eating as much as they can to maintain their weight. Um, and then the cost, it's expensive, and again, it's not insurance doesn't cover any of this. A brief outline um, of the SCD, foods that are excluded are grains, all grains, starchy vegetables like potatoes, sugars, milk and milk products, soy products, and then allowed foods are fresh meat, um, poultry and fish, fresh fruits and vegetables, legumes, most of them, fermented yogurt, and some hard cheeses. Nut flours are the primary source of baking, and then honey is used for sweetening. Kind of briefly, we'll highlight some studies that have been done. Um, the first study was actually here at Seattle Children's Hospital in 2013, and we had families coming in, and there had been reports for years, since the 1900s, that this diet has really helped with some people in management of their symptoms. Um, so we wanted to look back on patients that had been on the diet just on their own. And we found that overall, pediatric patients that had been on the diet had improvement of symptoms and improvement of BMI, so their body mass index and their weight. And then um, Dr. Cohen in Atlanta, they looked at a prospective study, so looking at patients over time, of over 12 weeks, I believe. And the study consisted of nine patients, and they all had a capsule endoscopy and to look at the mucosal healing. And mo over 50% of their patients as well had improved mucosal healing. And then currently we have a prospective study going on right now, and we've enrolled eight patients that have been on the diet, and it's strict on the SCD for a 12-week period. And then the hope over time is to gradually introduce whole foods back into the diet, like rice or organic potatoes, um, and assessing how one responds. You know, how are the inflammatory markers? How are the symptoms? Looking at all those um, aspects of remission that Dr. Wabe discussed. We're evaluating all of that. And, and five of the patients that have completed the study all have achieved remission. Um, there's a couple that dropped out of the study because it was very restrictive and their disease was pretty severe. So it, we haven't found that it's as um, successful and effective with severe disease. No question. That's a great question. Yes, they were. So kind of our outline showed that if you had been on a medication and started experience, experiencing symptoms or had elevated inflammatory markers, you could enroll in the study. However, if you'd started a recent medication within um, a month, including steroids, especially like an induction medication, you couldn't start on the study. So you could have been on Remicade for years, methotrexate, azathioprine. And one patient was able to actually wean off of their methotrexate 
after several months. Overall, there's a lack of studies which, with a large study population. It's hard to enroll kids to go on the diet, so it is restrictive. Um, we need to, to know if deep mucosal healing can also be achieved with this therapy. Um, a semi-vegetarian diet was briefly looked into in one study in Japan in 2010. It was a prospective study, so they evaluated 47 patients over two years, and all the patients started in remission, either through surgery, actually, or they were on a medication. They compared um, a standard vegetarian diet to what they called an omnivorous diet, or an omnivorous diet, and they kind of termed that word um, in relation to a Western diet, and we'll also discuss what that is. The SVD, this is semi-vegetarian diet, allowed fresh fruits and vegetables, eggs, plain yogurt, miso, green tea, brown rice daily, fish, milk, and algae once per week, and meat every two weeks. And then those on the omnivorous diet had meat more often, and they also had a greater intake of sweets. Results showed after the two-year period that 15 out of 16 patients on the SVD maintained remission at two years, and two out of six, or about a third of patients, remain, re maintained remission on the omnivorous diet at two years. We don't know, it's one study, brief glimpse in time with a certain population, so there's many factors that go into it, but it's an area that we can definitely look into more. The omnivorous diet kind of leads into discussion of what is the Western diet? And the Western diet is what developed co countries typically eat, and it's evolved over the past 20, 50 plus years um, in respect to changes in economics and the work that we do now um, in time. We don't have a lot of time to cook, so a lot of convenience foods have come out. Overall, the Western diet has a decreased consumption of whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, which give antioxidants and important nutrients, healthy fats, such as monounsaturated fats, and those are coming from avocados, olive oil, walnuts, and almonds. We have de decreased consumption of polyunsaturated fats coming from nuts, soybean, and fish and then a decreased consumption of omega-3 fatty acids, also from fatty fish, canola oil, flaxseed, and walnuts. Overall, the Western diet has increased intake of saturated fats, omega-6 polyunsaturated fats, and those are from grains, meat, and vegetables. They're not, none of these are bad necessarily in themselves, but they comprise a large portion of the Western diet. Um, trans fats, however, they've been kind of poo-pooed by the media, so we don't see them as often now. There's increased um, consumption of animal protein, simple sugars like corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, rice syrup. Um, we just eat a lot more sugar as a whole. And then we've also seen um, addition of food additives and processed or convenience foods such as emulsifiers and carrageenan. And those are just two we'll look at today, but there's many, many more that are added to our diet. We'll, we'll look at emulsifiers today. Um, emulsifiers are kind of soaps or detergents that break down fat, and we naturally have them in our GI tract to break down the fats that we eat. Um, they come in that vial that Dr. Giefer discussed. Um, some of the names that we see on food labels are polysorbate, polysorbate 80 is one we'll talk about, lecithin, like soy lecithin. Um, they're also, they're found in fast foods and kind of altered foods, so like low fat, margarines, um, a lot of condiments, um, Ice cream is another example. And some of the concerns with emulsifiers are the potential effects that they could have on the intestinal lumen, kind of the area where um, effect IBD is seen, where that inflammation is, and then possibly bacterial translocation. And we'll talk about what that is. Um, a group in 2010 did a study showing one group of patients that consumed daily intake of a soluble plant fiber and then another, the other group consumed on a daily basis this polysorbate 80 up there. And they found that there was an increased translocation of E. coli in the group that consumed this polysorbate 80 and a decreased translocation of E. coli in the group that consumed the plant fiber. And here's a little picture of why, how this could be significant. Again, we don't know for sure. 
studies are needed to further examine this effect in humans. Um, but we see the healthy intestine here in the lumen layer, and then there's this mucosal layer, and bacteria aren't supposed to necessarily move around all different areas in the GI tract. And when one has an infected intestine, whether it's with IBD or they've been ill or um, somehow this mucus layer has been broken down, we can see that different bacteria can cross that pink layer, the epithelium, and then go into our body circulation. Um, so again, we don't know how to what degree this occurs, um, but it's an area of, that scientists are curious to learn more about. And then the last um, food additive we'll talk about is carrageenan. And carrageenan is actually a starch that's been put into the diet for years and years and years. It's extracted from red seaweed, and it's used in the food industry for gelling substances, thickening, and stabilizing products like in dairy and meat. You'll oftentimes read it if you look closely on the food label. And the Food and Drug Administration um, are the people that kind of oversee our food and food labels and make sure that manufacturers really are putting what they say into our food. So we hope that we trust them. And they um, submit these statements, the GRAS or the GRAS statements, and these are for foods that are generally recognized as safe. And they actually came out with one just recently in February of this year. And I know it's kind of wordy, so bear with me. And it was after a study had been done on some guinea pigs eating a, a large amount of carrageenan in their diet. They said the available information on oral administration of undegraded carrageenan at levels greatly exceeding the daily human intake we don't know what that is, um, reveals evidence of possible adverse effects on the GI epithelium. Extensive recent event investigations of carrageenan and pathogenesis of GI changes indicates the susceptibility of the guinea pig to ulcerative colitis when fed relatively high levels of carrageenan in the diet. So they don't go on to say any numbers, you know, what proportion of the, their body weight was consumed in carrageenan. We suspect it's a large amount because they then go on to say that the amount that we eat on a daily basis is generally recognized as safe, the GRAS, and we shouldn't be worried at this time, but future studies are needed to, to evaluate could this um, play a role in IBD. To wrap up our case with our 15-year-old male JB with IBD, the dietician um, went to re review the food ingredient label of the protein shake he was on, and we won't even go through the exhaustive first part of the list, but looking at the bottom, it, the um, protein, and this was a very common protein supplement that you can get anywhere. Um, he was eating artificial flavors on a daily basis, multiple times a day. Soy lecithin, that emulsifier we talked about. Um, microcrystalline cellulose, which is in starch. Carrageenan, which is a starch. Um, and then sucralose, which is an artificial sugar that's been altered. So it's not even a normal form of a sugar. So the, the recommendation, um, by the team was to stop taking the oral supplement and to start on exclusive enteral nutrition in conjunction with a maintenance medication and the patient was able to achieve remission within 8 to 12 weeks. In conclusion, um, we know that nutrition therapy is an effective treatment option in pediatric IBD. Um, EEN and PEN are, have been used and are used at our institution as well as induction therapy. And the SCD is growing interest, and we actually use it as therapy for some of our patients um, who meet frequently with myself or one of the dietitians and one of the gastroenterologists to ensure that they're, that they're okay and it's safe and they are doing well. And in regards to diets, it is known that research as a primary therapy or as treatment in IBD is overall lacking. No one diet or ingredient has been found to cause nor cure IBD. But some things to consider are maybe a whole food diet versus more of the Western diet um, and how it may help with even maintaining remission as we saw in that um, Israel study. And potentially food addi additives and processing could play an adverse role in IBD, but we still really need to look into that. And I think we will see more studies coming out and how it may affect the GI tract. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions. <laughs> So to end the day, 
I wanted to celebrate the kids that are here and the future that you're going to have and all the wonderful things that you are going to accomplish. So to do that, I want to show you some slides, and I'm having trouble coordinating both hands to do music and slides. We're going to have to just do slides this time. So these are two girls. You met um, one today. In fact, I thought she was still here. Um, and one of our kids said, IBD is what I have. It's not who I am. So we have Camp Oasis. Don't they look like they're having fun? And these are two girls that um, met at camp when um, I think they were about 13. And they're um, now in college, and they've maintained that friendship and support. There's a group of them that went um, on a road trip over last spring break. So one of our boys studying abroad in Chile. Wrestler, he won. One of our kids at um, Eastern Washington, he works um, as a trainer manager, student trainer manager with the, their successful basketball team. This was one of the fellows on the panel, Lucas, who's in ROTC. This is one of our gals that does, um, it has a fancy name and I can't remember what it's called, but that you know how you do all the things with your horse and make them do things I can't do. But anyway, <laughs> she's very successful and she's doing that right now today. And Robin, um, who showed the, yay Robin, showed a longer video to the kids today. And so this was part of that. She said, I dreamed about studying abroad my whole life. But I thought that my Crohn's, and especially my ostomy bag, would limit me, and that I would never be able to go on my European adventure. But I was wrong. Someone with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis can certainly study abroad. If your disease is in generally healthy state, and you do a lot of planning ahead, you can do anything any other person can do. My four months in Europe were among the best of my entire life, and having Crohn's did not hinder my experience whatsoever. So you can see Robin's in Paris. Um, her primary study was in Ireland, and she had a fabulous time, which she told your, your kids about. So another member of the panel, Jordan, um, he's into his drama and his musicals. So this is the family. I am one in 200. One in 200 people have IBD except theirs is two out of four, because father and son both have um, IBD. These two, um, to celebrate um, their remarkable success and how well they felt, um, I think it was two years ago, took two of um, Sam's other buddies and their dads, and they climbed Mount Baker and put um, a CCFA flag there to raise um, funds for funding um, research. Well, yes, and then some of our younger kids are just having fun being kids. And Javon, is Javon here still? Nope. So she, she actually did double travel in this um, last six months. She did a mission to Nepal, and then she wasn't home but for about two weeks, and she had an opportunity to go with a group down to volunteer at an orphanage in Mexico. One of our fellows playing football. I don't know, I can't tell if that's just a football look or if they won or they lost. I couldn't, couldn't tell from the picture mom sent. I love this picture. <laughs> the top, the top um, fellow is referred to in this slide as little Tom, is a patient that we've seen here for years and years that was the manager, the assistant um, to the basketball team at Eastern. His one of the guys on the basketball team, which you see is very big, um, was diagnosed with Crohn's his first year in college. So two Toms, and the little Tom was able then to help the big Tom with uh, all these things because he is from Germany. Big Tom is from Germany. So Camp Oasis, paddleboarding anybody? This is one of our gals. What do kids do? You go off to college, you join sororities, and then you go on spring break. Fiona, and I told the kids, 
if you post something on Facebook, I will find it. So it is not, it is not secure, guys. If, if you don't want parents or your nurse or your doctors or your teacher to see it, don't post it on Facebook. And these are three girls that also, they met from camp and um, get together and, and have a good time. And this is um, Lauren, who volunteered um, today. And Lauren is graduating, and she's also a drama. We could, next year, we could have a play. <laughs> we have all these kids in drama. We could have them do a play. And Andrea, she's currently at um, University of Colorado, but she also did a study abroad um, this last um, fall in Spain. So when she went over to Morocco and had a wonderful experience. Camp Oasis, Camp Oasis. So our little boys and, and big boys and some activities there. So, and I told her, I said, I found it. Look at this picture I found. So Lizzie's, that was Lizzie that was in the fashion show, being silly. And so yesterday is dead. Tomorrow hasn't arrived. I just have one day and I'm gonna be happy about it. So we're not gonna worry about tomorrow. Yesterday is gone, but we're going to live today, and we're going to be happy about that. One of our, these are some of the, those older girls that have been to camp for a long time, and the, Andrea, who's in Colorado, said, we're strong, we are smart, we're here for each other. We may not feel ready for these challenges, but we will take them one day at a time, and we will succeed. Happiness is a way of life. So I want to thank all the people that spoke today. There was lots of people dashing around out um, with, um, with your kids. Heidi Zagorski, back in the back, Heidi. Thank you for organizing the kids' activities. And Rochelle, another one of our nurses, for mailing out all those, the flyers. Um, and we had a lot, it takes, it takes a village to put on um, a conference. And, we hope that this was helpful for you. We want to support you and we want to support your, your children. Whether you live here, you live in Idaho, you live in Portland, you know, we're all in this together. So we wish you well and your children will absolutely will be successful. So CCFA, Kathleen, we've had a great time hosting this for you and have a safe trip home. And the Mariners, Memo, the Mariners are ahead. Oh, you know that. Oh, he already knows that. Okay, bottom of the seventh. So, okay, thank you very much.